All right. Well, do you think I, I think we could, I can go ahead and do our introduction. So thank you all so much for joining us for our November, uh, you know, speaker series for the Ngoma speaker series. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce that Dr. Cooper is going to be giving us our talk today. Um, so just to read a little bit about his talk, which is titled Black Women as Mythological Archetype in Woman, King and Beyond. Um, in this talk, Dr. Cooper will explore an emerging African womanist archetype found in fiction ranging from queen, warrior, mother, scientist, villain, trickster, gunslinger, and ultimately as deity. We asked the question, is this a reemergence and renaissance of an African womanist archetype in film or simply rediscovery and morphed examples of African woman as Oshan? The talk centers the analysis in a Kawaii philosophical framework and diverts the discussions of the film away from Toni Morrison's notion of the white gaze, placing it aptly in Molefe Asante's articulation of an Afrocentric approach devoid of the lack of clear cultural cogency uh, found in the films. So we are very pleased and excited uh, to introduce Dr. Cooper. Great, good morning, everybody. Oh, I appreciate the applause. Now you guys are gonna make me get overwhelmed. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it's funny, as I hear the reading, I'm thinking in my mind, ooh, this sounds like a really interesting academic presentation. I wonder what he's going to say. And then it's like, oh, okay, it's me. <laughs> so um, again, we want to thank everybody for coming. We've had a good time um, over this last year, year and a half uh, with the Ngoma Conversations, where in fact, we are creating spaces, safe spaces, open spaces to have inter, intra, inner, across dialogues, which as you know, they're often exciting uh, challenge to have these kind of dialogues. So I'm gonna say to um, all the good folks that have never heard me speak in this manner before, I have um, really no interest in offending people. I just think that there has to be spaces where black people can at least attempt to tell their truth. Now, as we know, no truth is universal even amongst black people. But I think it's important um, just in terms of social agency for us to have spaces where we can say what we want to say, um, really to be understood and to be heard. Um, and again, so my point is not to be hurtful, but to be helpful, if that makes sense. So I just want to give that as a precursor. Um, Dr. Wise, I'm going to ask you to keep me to about 30 minutes because in the words of the late great Bob Marley, I have so much things to say, so many things to say, um, and I tend to get uh, rather excited, as has been known elsewhere, and I have more to say than I have time. I've, I've cut it down twice, um, and so with that being said, let's see if we can do all the buttons and get the PowerPoint up. And all I can say is that it ran correctly the five times I did it earlier. Um, okay, one second. Start from the beginning. All right, Dr. Weiser, uh, is everybody able to see a white screen? Yes. Great. All right, and again, good morning, everybody. And uh, this is a, uh, a topic, a presentation, an area that is really um, near and dear to my heart. And um, as others who have heard me speak before, I often, when I can, when I have the space to do so, um, really attempt to honor and acknowledge the ancestors. Um, it's, it's one thing to be of an African people, but it's another thing to uh, be an African person. And so it means for me that you actually have to practice. Um, you have to live. It's a, it's a live experience. It's not a uniform experience. It's not monolithic, but it's complicated. But, but I would argue that we have to live and be in this space and not academize it and make it an intellectual discourse. For me, it's cultural. 
And so in acknowledging the ancestors as is for some part of our tradition, it's important to say um, their name out loud. Um, and so in that regard, um, I wanna say the name of, um, I wanna remember a, a queen sister warrior uh, mother um, intellectual academic who made transition a, a dear a colleague of mine uh, and that would be Dr. Uh, Miriam uh, Mayat Kare uh, Manhez. She and I um, and Dr. Uh, John Gross worked together in the um, Africana Social Work Institute about uh, 25, 26 years ago, somewhere around there. And um, we did workshops and, and a lot of work together um, with and in conjunction with Dr. Thad Mathis of uh, Temple University. And we were attempting to uh, implement a paradigm that was fairly new across the country and across the world, which was an Afrocentric or an African-centered um, social work program in Ben Franklin High School. And we went on to do a number of workshops together. And slightly before that time, Dr. Mon has earned her a PhD in Africana studies. I remember sitting in on her dissertation well. In fact, she got her doctorate before I got mine, but her work, and if she were alive, uh, she died of cancer some years ago, but if she were alive, she would say, Richard, I see my work in your work. People are, affect you. Um, her uh, seminal work and book was Kush, the Jewel of Nubia, reconnecting the root system of African uh, civilizations. Her dissertation specifically which I'm gonna talk a little bit about was on the Candaces or Candaces as some pronounce it, which were these um, women warrior archetypes, um, one of which was a queen, but there were, they were Candaces. They were a, uh, a group of women in ancient um, Nubia and they were, they were warriors. And her interest sparked in them from, um, one segment that she saw in the Bible that I'll that I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, also, just to say, um, you know, if you're, you don't have to be far along in your age to be a person of African descent sometimes who feels like um, they are sick and tired of sick and tired. And, and that's a phrase coined by the late great uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Let me just let her say that for one second. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer was a uh, revolutionary. She did a uh, so much uh, in the 60s uh, in Mississippi and throughout the world in the Mississippi Freedom Party and um, a lot towards and about uh, emancipating um, Black lives through voter registration. And I don't have time to acknowledge um, her contributions here, but a lot of times I have felt as a person of a certain age, and, and my, my um, given that I'm in my 60s, um, I can recall films that did nothing but debunk um, shame um, African, African people, and particularly when they would appear in the continent of Africa. So oftentimes when you go to see um, almost any movie and you're Black, you, you have to mitigate, um, you know, this, this, this struggle or this push and pull that we have. Is this going to be something that's going to entertain me? Am I going to feel better after I see it? Am I going to feel shamed and degraded? Um, and so oftentimes we have to balance out whether we're going to go see a movie because it, it might be too filled with um, black historical trauma. And we have to evaluate, do I want to see that? Do I want to see something that's entertained? But oftentimes when you step out of these uh, movies, there's three, four, five, six, depending on who your audience is, ways to engage black audiences, um, just black people about the movies. Oh, uh, this was terrible. Was it real? Was it the correct history? Or why did they present it in this way? So uh, part of that perspective for me is um, one of being slightly sick and tired particularly of the stereotypical portrayals. Uh, I dedicate this presentation today um, to um, Black women, African women everywhere, or um, affectionately known as the sisters, who um, both in history and at present are um, some of the most um, beautiful, strong, intelligent, complicated, diverse, nuanced um, women. Um, so I wanna say that um, first. and and. 
um, because of the society are often, there's, there's an attempt to uh, degrade black women. Um, but the lens for me today is to, is to uplift, to be, to be very clear that there is not one um, pro profile archetype of black women. I'm just sick and tired of the strengths, the beauty, the aesthetic, um, the love um, of black women not being uh, presented. So I wanted to, in this presentation, to make it absolutely clear um, that is the perspective from which I enter this work today. Um, so what are we talking about here? Um, well, so we're talking about a lot of things. We're talking about films and movies in Hollywood. We're talking about a so-called renaissance or a rebirth or a new birth or the continu continuity of an old birth of Black women. But just so that I can center the dialogue a little bit, let me just begin by showing you a really short clip about the film. An evil is coming that threatens our kingdom, our freedom. But we have a weapon. They are not prepared for. My king, the Europeans wish to conquer us. They will not stop until the whole of Africa is theirs. We must fight back for our people. Time is come. You are asking me to take them to war. War. Some things are worth fighting for. Don't know. to join the king's guard. No kingdom in all of Africa shares this privilege. Train hard, fight harder. We fear no one. And we fear no pain. I offer you a choice. Fight or we die. That's just a clip uh, from the film. Of course, uh, in a talk that says in part, we're gonna discuss this, um, of course, there are gonna be some spoilers. So um, one of the things I decided to do today was um, we we are centering the talk in, in part uh, this film, but I, I'm also just curious about the, the, the renaissance or the reemergence of uh, black women in, uh, particularly in, in movies, but in the arts as well. And so, um, again, the talk is entitled uh, Black Women as Mythological Archetype in the Women King and Beyond. And I, I say this for my students. Um, another place I wanted to center to talk today is with, um, is with young people, is with young women uh, in my class and with all of my students. So um, my attempt is going to be able to keep it 100 for them. And it's, it's going to be grounded in a, in a Mayashian reality, um, justice, harmony, truth, um, balance. Um, and, um, and, 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 and oftentimes when you have these kind of conversations, um, because a lot of us historically are unaware, what would appear to be the myth in some of these presentations actually is a re representation of um, the reality. It, it can be morphed, it can be changed, it may be hybrid. Um, but if you look to the right, that's Dr. Uh, Miriam Mayat Kare Man has given a presentation, um, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago that was on the Candaces. And um, because she grew up in the church, 
there, there was there was one line um, I believe she said there was there's one line in, in frame of reference that acknowledged the existence of these um, black women in acts um, and he rose and went and and behold a, a man of Ethiopia and a eunuch of great authority under Candace Queen of Ethiopia Ethiopians who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem uh, for to worship and then I, I stop it there she said that it um, it prompted her curiosity uh, for some time. And here's a woman who, you know, like all of us who have um, doctors, got an undergraduate degree, master's degree in social work. And when she went to pursue her um, doctorate, um, you know, of course, with uh, rigorous study, she hearkened back to that sentence. And she said, who, who were these women? And she said they have to be black women, and it sparked a whole dissertation and a whole level of inquiry that she did. So, oftentimes, what is presented in a song or in movie, kind of as myth, as is grounded in actually um, reality. Um, so, what are we talking about here? Um, as I have said to my students in the course that I'm still presently teaching in. African American history that is um, that is taught by one of the best, and that would be Dr. Lola Ames, who has stridently been uh, teaching here at Widener and elsewhere. She's a tough act to fo follow. Um, her her uh, work and her detail are phenomenal. She's also teaching a course on the intersectionality of uh, Black women here, and it's just a pleasure to have um, people like her as a part of what we're doing here in, a, in the minor. And actually, I would argue that she's the bedrock. So I actually would dedicate this presentation to her and her work and her many contributions to Widener as well. Um, this talk here is about Black riffing in a way. It's, um, this talk is, um, as Dr. Wise in the write-up says, it's, it's really, I, I wanted to center it more in um, African womenist thinking, writing, um, prose, uh, analysis, um, and, and, and particularly to look at this broad or ever emerging um, uh, archetype of, of the many manifestations of Black women in history, a queen, warrior, scientist. And, and we could, if we had more time, we would, we would, we would look at other um, movies in the last 10, 15 years, um, Gunslinger. And ultimately, though, ultimately, as uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan talks about in his research and work, ultimately, as deity. When, when you go back and you look at ancient Kemet, um, as others have um, written, you will find how Black women were revered because they were seen as the pinnacle, as um, deities, as gods and goddesses. And oftentimes you'll see this in representations or in God narratives in um, ancient um, Africa. You'll see it in ethnic, cultural, and tribal uh, groups as well. So that when you when you go back and you look at this really broad swatch of presentations, uh, metaphor stories, um, Black women, African women are and were revered. Um, they, they were held to the highest um, um, worship, seen as goddesses, painted on war on walls. They are Orishas, they are they are queen mothers, they are they they're, they're, it's a really broad tapestry. So so actually um, when you look at what we experience here in this country, it's 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 through, unfortunately, the lens of what is referred to as the, the white gaze or um, so-called white racism. So again, today we're attempting to kind of uh, come at this from a black riffing tradition made popular in jazz or um, also called an imp 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 improvised verbal outpouring, or it can be as uh, indicated in the 1930s, a, a riff or refrain made famous by, um, by African-American uh, African dancers and composers in jazz. I had a student in my class maybe two weeks ago, I won't say her name, but she said, um, I have my students doing a series of presentations as we often do at the end of the semester. And she said, um, Dr. Cooper, you know, I'm, um, you know, I, I want to do a, a presentation about the origins of um, Black jazz. And I said, wow, that's really a great topic. I said, it's, you know, I approve. It's really a great topic. I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do and your PowerPoint and how you're going to how you're going to present that. And I said, there's just one correction I need to make. And it's a, probably a mistake I would have made some years ago. I said, we don't need to use the modifier Black on jazz. 
I said, um, jazz is black. And so it's like, you know, it's like saying, you know, black, black soul food <laughs> or black, black Afro. Like we don't need to, we don't need to quantify it double or triple times. If something is uniquely uh, and uh, created by black people, we don't need the adjective. In fact, when others do it, they, they might need to say Latin jazz or white jazz or contemporary jazz, but, but we don't need that moniker. So oftentimes we have been so disconnected from the cultural products that we have birthed created birthed since we're talking about women birthed into the world that we have oftentimes been disassociated with that which we have birthed to the world um and so um we're going to be um riffing here today in that tradition i don't have time to pull up all of the black women writers that i reference and read today um but one of which that you cannot forget is um, the great uh, Bell Hooks. Um, she gives an introduction here that I think underscores why I'm giving this presentation today at this time. So I'm gonna read from her book and it says, eight years ago when I first began research for this book, discussions of black women in feminism or racism in feminism were uncommon. Friends and strangers were quick to question and ridicule my concern with a lot of black women in the United States. I can remember a dinner where I talked about the book and one person in a big booming voice choking with laughter explained, what is there to say about black women? Others joined in in the laughter. And so she had written in the manuscript that the existence of black women was often forgotten, that we were often ignored or dismissed um, and then she said, uh, there's a typo there, but she said in her own lived experience, um, she shared these ideas in her book. So the mere fact that Black women exist and are sharing their lived experience, um, which she writes about in 1982 in her seminal book entitled, Aren't I a Woman? Black Women and Feminism. And she does this in the acknowledgments page. Um, one thing I began to learn, I think in master's school and doctoral school, when I read books, I read the acknowledgments. I, I wanna know who they're writing to, who they are thanking. And oftentimes that's where um, people are slightly more genuine in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, let me also acknowledge, which I don't have time to go into at depth, but the seminal work of um, Dr. Clonora Hudson Weems, who I remember watching her present in the 80s and 90s at the annual uh, Shake on the Joke conference um, created by Dr. Malefe uh, Kete Asante, where she was either presenting or developing her uh, paradigm of Africana woman and Africana womanism, uh, reclaiming ourselves. It is a beautiful and uh, complex um, construction, uh, deconstruction, in addition to the um, burgeoning paradigm of Afrocentric. Um, African-centered perspective and uh, feminist slash womanist perspective. And so I am attempting today in at least a portion of the conversation or a portion of the lens to, to center it there in her work, her, her social deconstruction, her analysis of ideas, her making it plain are uh, phenomenal. And to the left, you see her book, um, Africana Womanism. So I just wanted to ground it, a piece of the work there. Um, there, there's probably about 10 or 15 other books, but another one I found particularly interesting, and it's uh, it's an edited book um, entitled, entitled Culture Bearing Women in the National Family Plot, Black Women Renaissance versus Cultural Nationalism. And one of the things it does uh, in the book is that it looks at the burgeoning um, Renaissance, uh, post-Harlem Renaissance, 1920s, 1930s, um, African-Americans, um, some people call it the New York Renaissance. Um, um, the second Renaissance arguably would have been the uh, 60s, which I'll talk a little bit about because it's it's how we enter the discussions of, uh, of contemporary work today. But I think it's also important as, as people who are just curious to realize that, uh, particularly for African women, there's a Caribbean rem renaissance. There are other 
rebirths or births or artistic cultural expressions and startups that exist outside of America. And um, the longer I live, um, I have tried not to become an uh, intellectually speaking an ugly American and, and realize that much of my reading and study and inquiry has to be outside of um, a North American uh, discourse. So she points out in a um, rosterum of uh, writers, they really um, analyze uh, different aspects of um, women as feminist culture, uh, the Renaissance, and they go on to do it in by examining um, what women in the Caribbean have done. I would be remiss if I didn't mention, and I'm going to let her speak for herself, but um, the role of Black fiction in um, the Black arts movement in the um, wave um, in the 60s, spearheaded by many, but um, you, Toni Morrison. Um, and Toni Morrison, um, in case if you, and this is not an, an advertisement for Netflix, there's just some good stuff on there, but I'm, I'm not trying to do an advertisement for, for, for them. But as we speak, there is a, a documentary, if you haven't seen it, running on Netflix to the right, uh, Toni Morrison, The Pieces That I Am. Um, one of the things that I realized that there was a dearth in my knowledge, uh, I was a facts guy, give me the facts, give me the nonfiction stuff on um, African, African-American society. So as I've said to my students, I attempted to read everything that interested me in the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s and beyond. And I realized somewhere in the 80s, 90s that there was a dearth of my knowledge in nonfiction and that somehow, um, because I wasn't exposed to it in, in my formal education, I missed the amazing contributions of contemporary um, historical Black women fiction writers who really have, um, as we see now in movies and in hip hop and in lyricism and in prose, really have held it down and made these contributions that have allowed the movies, et cetera, to exist. Um, and uh, she, amongst others, was, um, early on criticized by her fervently, very strong decision to write about black female life, devoid of what she talks about as the white gaze. Um, so I, I wanna let um, Sister Toni Morrison um, talk uh, for herself. And um, Dr. Wise, if you could admit someone, I see an admit button. I, if I think if I touch it, it takes me out of my program. I think we got a person trying to get in. All right, let's let Toni Morrison uh, talk for herself. Somebody else over my shoulder. So they were, let's let her talk from the beginning. That question about, um, is about um, how black people are perceived elsewhere. Right. Um, it's about what will they think of us if we A, B, or C. That is such a censorship, such a self-censorship, that I just couldn't deal with it instantly. And I always knew that I was not going to write, keep your best foot forward kind of fake fiction. Uh, I felt it was too important. I knew I could not uh, dupe black readers. I thought they would catch me out mm -hmm. if I faked it. On the other hand, when they thought about them reading it, they would be perhaps embarrassed or, you know, wonder. Early on in my career, I remember a young woman in California respond. This is when, the, before I'd written the second book. She, I'd only written The Bluest Eye. And she said, I liked your book very much. And uh, I really love you for writing it. And I also really hate you for writing it because I didn't want them to know. So it was, a, it was like a public relations effort and always being sort of under the white 
gaze. And that gaze was so debilitating, so hurtful, so fructified everything. It just, you know, it was either excessive um, superstardom or something else. It was just a burden. So I determined to write outside that gaze and that there would be no, you know, um, token white vision in the book at all. And also I had always felt in some of the writers who are African-American that I liked a lot, that there was always this voice that was not talking to me. It was talking to somebody else over my shoulder. So they were writing for whites. In many instances. They were explaining things to people. Uh, they didn't have to explain it to me. You know what I mean? There was, I don't mean completely, and I certainly don't mean totally, but I think it's because, not because I'm a writer or even a reader, because I'm an editor, and I can feel that voice when it's being addressed outside rather than within. And that gave it a kind of awkwardness because you can't, I mean, I suppose it exists in other cultures, but you know, you don't feel that, you know, maybe some Russian writers are writing for the French. Maybe some French people are writing for the English. You know what I'm trying to say? But when is that, what has that got to do with it? So I just determined to stake my claim right there and not at all respond to this overwhelming perception of a non-black or a white gaze that was going to judge, respond to, and evaluate everything that I wrote. Tavia Butler, um, have to acknowledge her work. So all of this, I'm just trying to get you to the film, but but I, I have found in conversations and panels that I've seen online and conversations around the way, I, I just am not getting enough of what I wanted in the discourse and in the analysis of the film. So I said, hey, why don't I do an analysis of the film? But I'm going to stand on the shoulders of Black women if I'm going to do an analysis of the film. We have to mention then in that regard, Octavia Butler, who was one of the first earlier pioneers in what is referred to as um, Afrofuturism. She did not coin the term, but she wrote in what became the genre and was one of very few Black people, um, Black women who um, centered uh, the work in her fiction work in a cultural aesthetic and philosophy of science and history that explores, explores the intersection of the African diaspora culture with science and tech technology. Um, again, you're going to see that, um, and I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but you see that in Wakanda Forever. You see that in the first film as well. Um, it addresses themes and concerns of the African diaspora through techno culture um, and speculative fiction, encompassing a range of media and artists with a shared interest in envisioning um, Black futures that stem from as Afro-diasporic experiences. So uh, again, a woman bold enough to imagine um, a future grounded uh, in um, the realities of African people. When I grew up, uh, futuristic films didn't depict Black people. We, we don't exist in the future. Um, and still is often the case in, um, and we should use the ad adjective or modifier, uh, white future, futuristic films. Oftentimes they center it as if, you know, only white folks exist in the world so that um, even if they're apocalyptic films, like here we are, the end of the world, the year 2050, no black people or other people of color. In fact, the story, <laughs> so she was one of the few. And again, um, arguably this would be another aspect of an, a burgeoning uh, re renaissance. When we look historically at um, archetypes, um, myth mythological or, or other about black women, we, we find that these women actually existed. Um, the Candaces or Candike, um, the word was Latinized, but it's a, ancient comedic term for the sister of the king of Kush, who due to the matrilineal succession would bear the next heir, making her a queen mother. She had her own court, 
um, uh, probably was a landholder, uh, a regent, a warrior. And um, Dr. Monhez talks about this in her work in the in the 90s. And again, um, one little reference in the Bible spurned her or pushed her to go back, Sankofa, go back and fetch um, this history and to bring it forward as others have. Um, Black women as mythological archetype in the woman king or as real. Um, so again, for the young people, I, I said keeping it 100. Unfortunately, these archetypes that are brought forward are, are oftentimes grounded in reality that most of us, many of us have not been taught. I want you to just, just to begin to look at the resplendent images of the women. Look left, look center, look right. Snuck one in on the bottom. I like to play with images. If you've ever been in my office at Widener, um, from, the, from the ceiling to the floor, black aesthetics. From left to right, black aesthetics. I, I surround myself in images of Black people, historical, contemporary, that make me feel good, that center me in the struggle, that struggle, that help me to see the beauty. Um, and I actually years ago requested an office without windows so I could just fill the wall with stuff that kept me centered. Bottom image, that's Beyonce. Uh, I don't have the time in this space, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what Beyonce did in um, Black as King. Um, so surprise, we find out that there were real warriors behind the woman king. Um, Ajol J, the all woman army of the African kingdom of Dahomey. Um, I would say to my students who oftentimes I'm saying, please put your phone down. I would want to give them moments in class to pick their phone up and just look it up. It, the, the history's captured. I think one of the images that I have there is uh, from the Smithsonian. Um, they're all over the place that these, this, this female, uh, these, this, this Af archetype of women warriors. And, and again, not just centered in this pieces of history, but, it, but it's elsewhere. But just for today, we're talking about that. So these are real images. These are real women. They did exist. They did amazing feats. The, the training, the, the warfare, the, 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 the tactics. Um, and easy to find these days. Um, is it possible for two white women who um, produced and wrote the script to capture the regality, the beauty, the essence of um, African women? Is it possible? That, that's one of the critiques of the film. Uh, some people say no, some people say yes. Um, for me, it's a question today of um, Africana woman as social agency. The, 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 the will of the Black woman devoid of the writer, devoid of the narrator, to bring forth uh, her collective truth. But again, rather than me say it, let's let uh, Queen Viola Davis say it for herself. I have been so many nurses, so many social workers where you didn't even know my name. And if I had a name, no one spoke it in the movie. I was in and out and people would say, you were in that movie? Um, <laughs> I didn't want that to happen at this point in my career. To be a warrior, you must kill your teeth. I think it speaks for itself. It's agency, it's ownership, it's autonomy. It's a fact that there is no white savior. It's a fact that black female character driven and dark skin black female character driven. It's an action historical drama, which means, yeah, we get to play, we get to transform our bodies, but also they're people. These are women. They're led by their past memories, their vulnerabilities. It is a full and complete story, which we don't benefit from a lot in Hollywood. I have been so many nurses, so many social workers where you didn't even know my name. And if I had a name, no one spoke it in the movie. I was in and out and people would say, you were in that movie? Um, 
I didn't want that to happen at this point in my career. The things that were written about this kingdom, these women, so often it was coming from a colonizer's point of view. So being able to find the truth and find the accurate depiction of these warriors of this kingdom. But we had incredible researchers, incredible consultants, and just a, an absolute desire and demand to be authentic and to get it right. I'm proud of the sons. Yeah, yeah. I came in, I went from literal zero, you know, struggling with two and a half pound weights to being able to do what we did. Even if you have a physical background, even if you've gone to the gym or played sports, there's nothing that's <laughs> gonna be able to prepare you for this. We went all in and it was, it was tough work, but it's so rewarding to yeah. see yourself and everyone else like, yeah be the character physically the, the muscles the even putting the oil on our bodies you can see us like glistening from the inside out which was incredible to watch dark skin as well all around yeah. the cast and the supporting artists it was it was powerful we wanted to show that warriors could come in all shapes and sizes but the key is that we can be warriors women can be warriors we can be athletic and that's that was really the intent and also, I think in, in putting together a platoon, ultimately, that, that each one had a very individual, you know, personality and, and function, you know, within this scheme. I am afraid of heights. I had wire work that I had to do. I had to jump off a platform, you know, got to a place where I was like, Danny, you remember that I don't do heights, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I did it! And it's in the fall. Mm. Yes. For me, it was the dancers. Yes. Oh, yes. Battle yes. dance. Oh, yes. yes. Because, because, you know, I'm like, yeah. I can move, but I'm not a dancer, right? I'm not like somebody who regularly has to undertake choreography. Yeah. And, you know, we were at the front of <laughs> the, the big battle dance. And I remember just thinking, we have to bring this. Um, and y'all did it. This and, like, oh and like, with the aggression, you yeah. know, because there's, there's the choreography and then there's <laughs> the aggression that's required. Every and then the stamina yeah. required to yeah, yeah. pump that aggression into the, it was just, I, I, I felt like I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there like the way they were dancing. <laughs> <laughs> dying, dying, dying. Yeah, yeah. And dying, dying. I came in in the middle of the shoot. And honestly, I felt so bad, but good at the same time because, you know, I've, I've watched everybody in projects before, but seeing them in real life and then seeing their bodies completely transformed. Mm. Viola walks out and it's it does something to the posture. They, I can tell that their muscles have been lifted to, to reach the surface of their skin. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me tuck stomach. in this soft stomach a little bit. <laughs> and let me just, you know, support them in, in all they're doing. But honestly, it was, it was inspirational to see that. On a movie like this that we haven't seen before, that hadn't been done before, and I think we're all proud of the fact that we were able to work together with a studio that finally understood the significance of who these women were, what this story meant, the and the fact that, exactly, and that we could go in and, and sell that and then actually be able to execute it, that was huge. My husband and I, our production company, we produced it. We are the home And I cannot tell you what a joy it's been. And when I say joy, it's more of a paradox. Mm -hmm. A joy it's been to walk into a room and fight for this piece because it was worth it. It was worth fighting for the Lashanas, Sheilas, Tussos, Adrians, Jamies, you know, John. It was a, it was a joy because I knew that it would result to this. Dr. Cooper, I just want to let you know it's it's 1246. Great. I'm going to end here. I'm going to say two things. Thank you, because I want to get some questions in here. So, um, and I said I had too much to say. Um, this ties into, um, um, so I'm going to encourage people to go back and 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 just, you know, say in Kofa, go back and find what you haven't been exposed to. This all ties into the Black Arts Movement. Uh, this ties into which I will not show. I'll put a PowerPoint because um, I want to get some questions. I'll put a PDF of the PowerPoint. But this ties into a couple years ago. Uh, Beyonce did this "Black Is King" uh, piece that we could do a two-hour, three-hour presentation on that. It was inspired by the 2019 remake of The Lion King. I was a little bit surprised and disappointed. Uh, again, not to say anything bad about young people. Two years ago, when I raised it in my class with my students. Um, they weren't following it. And, you know, like I struggle sometimes because it's like, 
yeah, follow pop culture, but then you got to study it as well. Um, Wakanda Forever, which we could talk about, and I'm going to stop right here, is um, it opened in 4,396 theaters, uh, took in 84 million on the opening on Friday, and the first uh, Black Panther film took in billions of dollars. Orish, uh, Ojun is actually, it's a deity um, in the Yoruba faith, which is, you know, residually still um, known in um, African, African uh traditions in Yoruba traditions and elsewhere. Let me let me stop here. Um, so um, one of the points I wanted to make today is that what would appear to be myths in terms of fictionalized so-called movies actually are the ancestors, I would argue, you know, coming forward, uh, still telling these stories, still telling these truths that are manifesting themselves in other ways today. I will stop there in the interest of time and hopefully we'll get a question or three in there. Thanks everybody for listening. I could do this for two hours. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. If anyone has a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat or you can just go ahead and unmute and ask. Um, yes, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I'm from the Good Neighbor Senior Center. And when we did the invite it was because we had just read in our book club, The Three Mothers, um, the story about Martin Luther King's mother, Malcolm X's mother, and James Bald Baldwin's mother. And there was a lot of questions and emotions that derived from what these Black women had gone through to raise their sons. And that's why we, when I saw what was uh, here, I wanted the people from that book club just to get a taste of the king, the queens that Black women really are. So thank you, Dr. Cooper. I really appreciate what you've done. Yes, say your grandson's name for me. So um, I got an email from you that said, your grandson is in my course and could you guys join us? Who's your grandson? Uh, Keon Stevens. Hey, Keon, we're putting you on blast. My bad, but we're putting you on blast. Hey, Keon, if you're here, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Sister Karen. We And you can join us in the future. Thank you. Thank you for my members, so thank them very much. We're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of thank yous, very much appreciated, phenomenal, multi-layered. Thank you so much. Dr. Cooper, how are you and how is everybody? If I could just say this, um, this was so refreshing. Um, I did see the woman king and not to give anything away for those who have not. It's just simply good to see a movie where people who look like us were in a, um, I wanna say quality movie, but that's not the word I'm using. Um, it was simply phenomenal. Me, myself, I have chosen not to watch any more movies related to slave or anything like that. And it's simply because it does not leave me in the right frame of mind. Um, a girlfriend of mine was interested in seeing Till, which I will not see. And she happens to be my a white sister, love her dearly. But I said to her, I can no longer watch those movies because we all pretty much know what it was about. But because it doesn't sit well with my soul in today's time, I just, I stay clear of them from now on. But when I saw Woman King, I left there feeling very much empowered, very much just refreshed. So you are so right when you say things like how we are portrayed matters. Um, so this was excellent. And as always, thank you for this conversation. Just pausing for others to jump in. I, I could speak for an hour, uh, sister, <laughs> for what you just said, but thank you. I think Carly has her hand raised. Oh, yeah, hi, Dr. Cooper. Based on that last comment, too, I'll just ask you for your thoughts or opinion. What do you hope to see in the future of film and media and books and portrayals for Black women and African folks and I heard you speak about Octavia Butler and I know that she's doing amazing work with these books and Afrofuturism that's coming out. And do you think the tide is turning kind of on that portrayal of black pain and black trauma porn to kind of see this greatness and woman is king? And what do you hope to see kind of in the future of media? I heard you questioning your students to analyze the, the pop culture more. 
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that question. Thanks, for, thanks uh, all of my colleagues and everybody for attending. It's really kind. Um, I find what I don't know already exists. So I'm still going back uh, to the Tony Morrison's and 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 um, so uh, in the 80s and 90s, I knew quite a few of black professional women in social work. Well, of course I did social work. And they were avid readers of um, black Ooh. women as fiction. And so stuff that I have, I'm, I'm still catching up. So I, I found that the work that black women have done from 1900s to, you know, arguably the present, I'm, I'm still reading, which should have been, you know, not just the color purple, should have been cast in movies. Oftentimes it's the scripts to movies. To the younger people, I say um, in prose, in spoken word, in lyrics, in, um, so I wanna see more of the um, renewal, the burgeoning. I wanna see the, the expansive aspect of it. I ultimately, um, I share the sentiment expressed about Till. I just have to balance off how much I can take. I'm getting old and I'm like, oh, I can't like, or I can't, I don't wanna leave movies where I want it to, you know, harm people because of what they've done historically. I'm, I'm not gonna harm anybody. I, I don't endorse any kind of violence. Please, people know that. But it's just a feeling that you have, a feeling of of rage where you're just, just... so I hope to see um, the diversity. I hope to see, um, I think Beyonce's work that I just don't have time to talk about, but go look at what she did with Black is King, the images, the um, um, inter, Black people, we are one of the most colorful, complicated, racially diverse, ethnically diverse people from within an archetype of a group, probably in the history of womankind, probably in the history of the world. So I wanna see representations of more of the diverse skew of women, body type, age, perspective, and continent, and, and not just in North America. That's what I'm looking for. And I think we should do it through you know the arts, the sciences, music, et cetera. I could go on and on. Hopefully I answered your question. Thank you. Okay, I, we have time for one more question. I have a, a question or a comment. Oh, well, yeah. uh, thank you so much for the content. Um, I saw the movie, I saw it with a friend and I left the movie feeling so happy. My spirit was fed. It was, um, to me, I saw the women as leaders, I saw their strength, but I also saw their compassion and their, you know, being family oriented. I got all of that out of the movie. And my friend left the movie saying that she thought, depending on the lens of who's watching it, that it will help to, um, I guess some people have this stereotype of seeing um, African-American or black women as, as aggressive. And that's what she left, that, that is what was stuck in her head. And so we got totally different meanings from seeing the strength of these women and seeing them in these roles. Thank you. It is so hard to begin to undo the um, mm -hmm. history of um, oppression that has been promulgated through images, through uh, stereotype, through bigotry, through you know good old fashioned white racism. And so oftentimes, um, even just black people in the room, um, it, 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 it's so difficult to get away from the, the, the limited ways that we have been stereotyped. And when you only have two or three or five movies a year, you're just not gonna be able to undo that. And that's why we need, and I'm gonna stop here. That's why you need minors and majors in African-American studies. And that's why you have to take on the academy. You, you can't just have a liberal arts paradigm and frame a reference in school that is simply a Eurocentric and a white liberal arts paradigm. So let's put the adjectives where they belong sometimes. Let's just not call something you know, liberal arts. The, the corrective part of it is that we have to teach white, black, yellow, and brown people African studies, Latin studies, career studies, indigenous studies, 
to kind of balance this out. So it's hard in one movie. Uh, sometimes people can walk away feeling hurt in the same movie, same experience. Other people can walk out and feel overjoyed. But, and I'll, pa I'll pause here, Jen, I know we're getting to the end of time. But oftentimes I'm happy to have a group conversation because oftentimes people are watching a movie on a little device all by themselves. And the discourse and the interaction and having a community to share an experience can help a person who may have seen it in one way come to understand it in another way. Hopefully I answered your question. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cooper, for your presentation is very good. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming to our last NGOMA speaker series of the fall 2022 semester. Um, so thank you all very much. And yes, have a good rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good work, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Wise. I think I can stop the recording. And actually, I probably have two or three more uh, meetings I'm running off to. I think I see my cousin in the audience, mm -hmm. William Wilson Denson. How you doing, cousin? On the West Coast. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining. And thanks for joining from the Senior Center. I'm going to wave to all the folks <clears throat> in the Senior Center. I see you all there. If you're having lunch, enjoy or having a meeting. Thanks for coming, everybody. And good work with your book club. All right. And I see good Dr. Good job, Ames. Dr. Rich. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>